big changes in the UK media landscape today, which I thought I'd catch us up on from wherever I am on the road. First up, Talk TV. So Murdoch's TV station moves to online only. That's a failure of Talk TV to capture a significant enough audience in terms of numbers and share, and also a reflection of the move of everything at the moment. You can safely assume that at some point in recent weeks, there was a very difficult meeting between Rupert Murdoch and Piers Morgan, where Rupert Murdoch not only said to Piers Morgan that we've got to let you go with this whole Prince Harry stuff and the finger of blame coming ever more tightly towards you, and also Murdoch certain that he was going to go online anyway. So that will have happened a couple of weeks prior. Either way, talk TV no longer on your TV screens. In other news, GB News now, what, 50 million, 60 million in the red, so losses greater than ever. They have either let go, fired or Dan Wooten left, one of the above, and Dan Wooten leaves the channel in an official capacity. Uh, so the Ofcom investigation against Dan Wooten found that he acted in this way, that way or the other, whatever. He leaves the station. He goes to do his own thing online. More significantly, I think, is Neil Oliver. So one of the last remaining kind of bold spokespeople at GB News, uh, for many of us recognising it was only a matter of time before he had to be shoved out of the normal roster, his show is going to be moved online. So that kind of circumvents the Ofcom issue, gets Neil Oliver online for his actual show, and then he can be edited into a format that is appropriate for TV, i.e. can evade Ofcom's censorship. And this is a sort of a, a real pity, actually, because in live is what you're getting, a sense of authentic. Once that's gone through edits and once various elements have been cut out and then it will go through more management and more bits will be cut out until it becomes rather dull because once you remove the stuff that's of interest to make it okay and palatable for Ofcom, then of course what you're left with is the rather sort of dull remains of that. There's a few really important points that I wanted to address. Number one is this very peculiar need for anyone who doesn't toe the line or fall into line with the narrative that's approved by the establishment to be removed. It has always been true, certainly something I experienced a decade ago in a far more lonely setting, is if you go against the narrative of the establishment, you have to be culled. And that cull will happen in any number of ways. For me, it was using uh, personal attacks against my family, lawfare against me that ended up uh, taking my family home and a number of other methods. Um, in this case, with GB News roster, it's been using Ofcom as a tool of censorship that was also used against me at LBC. So using Ofcom to be the censor that then enables the establishment to get back to controlling the narrative. And that's effectively the weapon that's being used against GB News. And it's very easy for that weapon to be used by the establishment because they can almost put the bat into the hands of the general public. So when the woe karate and the left decide to gang up on GB News, they get everybody to put in an Ofcom complaint. They do a sort of template for people just to send into Ofcom. That generates the complaints that are required for Ofcom to investigate, Ofcom investigate, and going along with what the establishment would hope for, they get rid of anything that doesn't follow the narrative that's approved. That's how Ofcom is used as a weapon, and that's what will eventually see the end of GB News if the investors don't get cold feet first. They do seem to have deep pockets, but I'm guessing that's for only for as long as the Tories are in power. The other interesting thing is the way that uh, not only do these alternative media channels or talk TV or GB News have to be removed, but there's this weird celebration that goes on. So Vorders and others celebrating that GB News will eventually go or that talk TV have gone or that Dan Wooten has gone. And I find that a really strange thing. 
because if you get rid of these other channels, it doesn't affect you, Carol Vorderman. It doesn't mean your audience increases. You seem to think of it as some sort of battle against, you know, hope versus hate, to quote one of the most hateful organisations out there. You see it as some sort of battle. This is a win for right-minded individuals. Well, that works on the basis, Carol, that you are the arbiter of what is right, or you are the arbiter of what is hopeful. And that isn't true. You are, of course, in charge of your own opinions and your own views, but you are not the arbiter of what is right or wrong. So watching news channels be removed or alternative voices be removed, I fail to see how that's a win for anyone. And I say that regardless of who's being censored or removed. Surely more voices are always better than fewer. And it is always incorrect for people to make themselves the arbiter of what is morally right or better for people. And then we go into some <laughs> next level details, which is, I think it is beyond insulting to infer that ordinary decent people can't make up their own minds what they listen to. That's the biggest insult of all. And from a personal perspective, when I'm cancelled from something or a venue pulls under pressure, the insult is not only to me and what I'm trying to do, which is a really nice thing. The insult is to the audience, whether you want to buy a ticket or you don't. The insult is that you aren't smart enough to know what you want to listen to, that you need someone to advocate on your behalf for what you should be allowed to go and see. And that is the insult in all of this. It's not about individuals. It's not about this guy or that guy. Um, and I have to say, of course, um, without bitterness, that many of these guys were very happy as long as it wasn't happening to them. But um, it's the insulting nature that an audience can't decide for itself what it wants to listen to and the greater insult that is not discussed. That someone might choose to watch GB News, but they might also be watching it and disagreeing with some of it. It is very, very rude to infer that anybody watching GB News agrees with all of it. That isn't what the audience is doing. It's like people that come to my shows. They're not coming because they agree with everything I say. They're coming because it's quite enjoyable. It's nice to be out and about. It's nice to sit with people. It's nice to be with people who don't judge you. It's nice to feel that you could be a bit at home, but think differently and all of those things be okay. It's about allowing people to be and make their own minds up. And by censoring and removing all of this, you remove people's ability to watch, observe, listen, and make their own minds up. And that is the greatest insult in all of what's going on, which is why there's absolutely no cause for celebration, I'd argue, at any level for anyone. And the other point um, I wanted to make, well, there's two actually, is that increasingly the online world, so Neil Oliver online, Dan Wooden's going to do his thing online, Lawrence Fox is going to do his thing online, online, Talk TV will go online, which is great, but it's that everything is so fractured. The same with the social media thing. Russell Brand belongs to whatever he belongs to. Over at Twitter, you've got Tucker. And then in Trump's world, you've got Trump stuff. It's so fractured. And that's curious because it used to be back in the day, we all gathered around a TV. There were three, four channels and we watched things together. And whilst I think it's super great that there's so much content available and you can pick and choose and that's a glorious thing, there is something about the shared experience. And that brings me to my final point, which is that I think the individuals who are currently trying to put a brave face on it, going out to a brave new world online to try and make their way, 
um, which will never be as comfortable as receiving a fat paycheck written by someone else and having a production team and an editorial team and people suggesting stories and the ability to get an interview because you have the badge of a TV show. It's far harder, of course, out on your own. But I think having been out on my own for what I was cast out, I guess a decade ago nearly, is what people actually want isn't this fractured online experience where you can go to a person, hear what they're saying, agree with them, and that's great. I think the genuine thirst is for that shared experience. There is something almost nostalgic about being together to listen to something acknowledging that you can think differently, agree, disagree, have fun, don't have fun, go and get a drink, go and have a wee, come back, talk about what you've just heard together, talk about the bits that you found the funniest, talk about the bits that were just like you or weren't. And that's where the beauty of live events, I think, is at the front line of where all of this is moving to. People are tired of online. People want authentic and authentic. You, online feels more authentic because look, you look like you're sat in a, you know, I look like I'm sat in Belmarsh. I'm not, just for the record. But what people actually want, I believe, through experience, having left mainstream, been thrown out of everything, censored from my own country, forced out of my own country, banned from other countries, and having kind of done a full 180 now, is what people want is that shared experience of, of listening to someone and sharing together. And that's the beauty of being on the road. So I guess in summary, it is a very curious thing that the establishment cannot bear and will not tolerate alternative views, that in order to batter those down and get rid of them, they put a weapon in the hands of the public, which is this bat, which means that they can report to Ofcom, Ofcom can act as a censor, and those alternative voices can be got rid of. It is a very odd thing that certain individuals celebrate the removal of other voices, as if they are the arbiter of what is right or wrong. It is very insulting to imagine that ordinary people can't decide for themselves what they want to listen to or hear, and even more insulting to assume an audience is listening to something and agreeing with all of it. They're not. A hundred different thoughts are going on in their heads and they'll choose the ones that feel the most right to them. And finally, and most importantly, as the online world gets so fractured and lacks any kind of cohesiveness with people just competing for views and clicks, actually, I think where the front line is, is live events where people are joined together. They can listen with their whole selves in person and remember what it feels like to be part of a truly authentic and human experience. And that is where we're at in the media landscape today.